the church say amen? Amen. To our ministers, to the officers, um, to Reverend Dr. Shields, and to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Oh, how good the Lord is. Yes, he is. Amen. Thank God for what you have left. Every day is a good day. When you know the Lord. When you know the Lord. Yes. Today we are going to call your attention to Romans, the 12th chapter. We are lifting verses, verse 1 through 5. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through verse 5. Romans, the 12th chapter. The first through uh, the fifth verse. Romans chapter 12. Verse 1 through 5. And when you have found it, say amen. Amen. Let's read this text together. Let's read. I beseech, I beseech you, therefore, brother, 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 by the, the mercies of God, God that you present your bodies in a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according to God, God hath dealt, dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ. And every and one every members one, members one of another. One of another. Amen. Amen. The word of the Lord. I want to talk today about fulfilling our purpose in Christ. Fulfilling our purpose in Christ. What is our purpose as disciples of the Lord Jesus the Christ? It is to help the local church achieve its objectives and goals by disciplining, developing, and employing those to whom God has called to fulfill his purpose in the church. Dr. George Squeeze had once said, when the church stands still, it slips backwards. Mm. Jesus didn't commit the gospel to an advertising agency. He commissioned disciples. We are living in the last days. We are in a race against time, against sin, against Satan, and against self. In looking at this text today, there are some most needed questions we must ask ourselves. Am I tough and mature enough for the job? Is prayer priority in my life? How do we rate ourselves on Bible knowledge? How often do we attend Bible study? Are we team players? God doesn't call the qualified, but he qualifies the call. There's no room for self-gratification or glorification. So we have to raise the question, can you and I stand constructive criticism without taking it personally. Wow. The epistle to the church at Rome is God's special delivery mail to the church. It was written by Paul during his three-month visit in Corinth. It is one of the most powerful and influential books ever written over time. Romans is a great exposition of the faith. The basic thing is the righteousness of God that is, the just shall live by his faith. Right. Now, first of all, when we peruse this pericope, the first thing we discover here is, as we deal with the first two verses, is we see Paul's appeal. 
Notice what the text says. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, sacrifice is whole. God will not accept a partial sacrifice. It has to be 100%. The totality of our being. It has to be total surrender. Let every act of your living body show that Christ is more precious to you than anyone or anything else. Notice what he says, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. But you see, renewing the mind is Paul's appeal to the church at Rome. Don't let other people control how you think. There are many minds that are messed up in the body of Christ. And Philippians 2 and 5 says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He appeals here in the text for sacrifice, a living sacrifice a sacrifice of our time, of our talent, and our treasure. He appeals for spirituality because he says, holy, hagios, which means to be separate, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He appeals for sacrifice, he appeals for spirituality, and yet he appeals for service because he says, reasonable service of worship. You see, the problem is that our minds are fallen. They have a spirit, a bent, a mindset that is hostile to the absolute supremacy and sovereignty of God. Our minds are bent on not seeing God as infinitely more worthy of praise than we are or the things we make or achieve. To renew your mind means to commit your mind to memorization of and meditation on the word of God. I think that's what the writer was saying in the first psalm when he says, let this mind be in you. And he said, brethren, he tells us to be careful about walking in the presence or walking in the ways of the ungodly or standing in the way of sinners or sitting in the seat of the scornful, verse 2, for his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. So he says that the word of God ought to be our delight, for his delight is in the law, namas, the law of the Lord, and in his law, not only should it be our delight, every Christian's delight, but the word of God ought to be our doctrine. But his delight is in the law of the law, doctrine. And he shall meditate. That means that not only should he have delight in the gospel, and not only should it be his doctrine, but it ought to be his discipline. Yeah. Because he says, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So he gives an appeal to the Roman church, but then not only does he give an appeal, but the second thing he gives in verse number three, we see Paul's attitude. Notice what he said, for I say, through the grace given unto me, that is, that grace which is unearned, that grace which is undeserved, is given to every man that is among you, every believer, every Christian, every child of God. And then he says, not, what is the attitude? Paul says, not to think. Franeo, which means to overestimate oneself, to elevate oneself, to be of the opinion of oneself more highly than he ought to be, but to think soberly. That means to think wisely then. To think of sound judgment according as God had dealt to every man the measure or the portion of faith. In other words, if your faith fizzle before the finish, 
it was flawed from the first. And God has given all of us faith, and that is, and he says it so simplistically, that if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can speak to your mountain, and your mountain, y'all still with me? Will move. Because that's what faith is. Faith is really taking God at his word. Faith is the already in the midst of the not yet. And God is no respecter of persons, but God is a respecter of faith. There was a pagan man one time came to Jesus. He had a franchise man at home that was near death. He came to Jesus, he had heard about Jesus. He approached Jesus and said to Jesus, he said, I've been hearing about you, I heard a lot about you. That you can give sight to the blind, that you can unstop deaf ears, that you can take five pancakes and two sardines and open up a y'all step up there? A bread factory in a fish market and feed over 20,000 people. I know and I have a servant at home and I want you to come home and heal my servant. And Jesus said, all right, let's go. Mm -hmm. And while Jesus was on the move, the pagan thought about something. He said, I might as well come clean with him today. He said, now Lord, the folk that live at my house, they don't sing amazing prayers. The folk that at my house, they don't care for preachers. The folk at my house, they don't sing this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. But if you just speak the word, I know my servant is going to be all right. You see, God will always honor us our faith. Yeah. Come here, Israel. I want y'all to go around the walls of Jericho. All right, all right. I want you to march around six days. I want you to march around one time. Mm -hmm. But on the seventh day, yeah. I want you to march around seven times. Yeah. Now you would look at that and seem to suggest that that doesn't seem to make much sense. That God got to have you to march around six days, one time, and on the seventh day, seven times, and to have people to blow horns and folk to shout, and the walls of Jericho will come tumbling down. God is a God who honors faith, and faith will get the job done. And so here Paul deals with attitude when he talks about what God will lives for our life. What is God will? For our life. Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever thought about Christian transformation produces humility? Paul is saying, I could even begin to think too highly of myself as an apostle were it not for one thing, and that is the grace of God. All my calling, all my gifts, all my authority is a work of God's grace in my life. I don't deserve it. I don't muster it up. It is all God's grace. You see, whenever you drink grace, you got to drink it straight. You can't add the ice of your singing and the ice of your good works and the ice of your giving. It is grace plus nothing equals salvation. That's why Paul can say, for by grace, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, for it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that's the way God is going to save us, by grace. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now Noah wasn't so much better than anybody else, but he found grace and built an ark 120 years. And God sent down the rain. Oh, I love the grace of God because grace what kind of grace does God give us? He gives us sleeping grace yeah. and waking up grace yeah. and putting on your clothes grace yeah. and eating grace yeah. and drinking grace. Y'all want to help me today? And praying grace. Yeah. And that's the kind of grace he gives us. We are saved by grace. We grow by grace. We are endowed by grace. We are what we are only by God's grace. And we are saved by the grace of God. That's why, that's why Paul can let you know, by the grace of God, I am not that I am, but I am what I am. Because all of us have some faultiness in us. And God can help us. And so here he is, 
This is what Paul is saying to us today. We are what we are by grace. And their temptation there at Rome was to think too highly of themselves. Yeah. A problem with big heads and inflated ego. Yeah. The glory of God, you see, belongs to the giver of the gifts. We lose all of our rights when we die to self. You see, one thing I've discovered in reading this text, it shows that, you see, pride is Satan's right. number one right. sin. Amen. And that used to be a song the old soldiers used to say, if I'm too high, Lord, please bring me down. How can you avoid thinking too highly of yourself? There are two, two suggestions. First of all, you have to humble yourself so God doesn't have All right. to humble you. Right. And then secondly, you have to realize that you are fortunate to be part of your local church. It is important to understand that you are not God's gift to your church. You must be reminded that it is not the church's blessing to have you and I. It's God's grace that lets you in. Right. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. I like what Winston Churchill said. He said, cemeteries are filled with men who thought they were indispensable. Right. What is humility? It is the emptiness of self which God feels. It is recognition and application of who you are in Christ. The Bible says, he who exalts himself shall be obeyed, but he who humbles himself shall be exalted. You see, we go up by going down. All right. All right. God, all right. You all remember Nebuchadnezzar, yeah. who thought he was bigger than God, and decided that I have status, I have significance, I have riches, I have everything that money could buy, but he didn't have God. He, 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 he decided that he was going to compete with God. He looked around great Babylon. He saw the beautiful hanging plants. He saw the servants who were decked out in their, in their royalty. And every time he would stop, one would fall to the ground and say, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the man. And then he got lifted up in pride and said, is not this great Babylon that I have made? And the Bible said that something occurred. He had what you call an intellectual relapse. He went from anthropology to bestiology. He went from a human being out in the wild like an ox. He was eating grass for seven long years. At the end of seven long years, you know, he would have been a sight to see. Had had a haircut, had had his hair comb, had had his teeth brushed, had had no dove soap on his arm, had had no zest. Y'all still with me on it. He had never washed his face because he had been eating grass like a lot for seven long years. Look at the king of Babylon out in the wild eating grass because he wanted to compete with God. And God said after seven years he gave the king back his mind. He got up, stood up like a man. Y'all still with me on it. He went and stunk up the whole kingdom. He went and took a bath. He got his hair cut. And perhaps in our dead time, we would have got a pedicure or a manicure. He had an emergency meeting. He told all of his staff, he said, if any man in here cross God, you're a dead man. God, you know how he's dead on the You have a witness here. Remember Paul? Paul thought that he was bigger than God. Paul, whose name used to be called Saul, which means much desire. And God had to reduce him from Saul, much desired, to Paul, which means little. You see, until we get to become Paul and not Saul, God can't do much with us. He thought he was bigger than God. He thought he was bigger than the church. And he decided that he was going to arrest the church and kill off the church. And because they didn't, y'all still with me? Because they didn't embrace Paul's theology. Theology was a law theology, but when Paul didn't know that the law that he was studying and the law that he was reading was pointing to Jesus Christ. You see, a law is just like an x-ray machine in a hospital. An x-ray machine can show you that you got a broken bone. The x-ray machine can show you that your teeth is out of line. The x-ray machine can show you that your ankle needs a splint, but the x-ray machine can't fix your problems. You need Jesus to do that. to the high sheriff's office and got an arrest warrant on the church. Yeah. He went down on his way to the master yeah. his pig party. 
and decided that he was going to quit the church in jail. And the Bible said while he was journeying on his way to arrest the church, he ended up getting arrested by the woman. He said, Lord, he said, Lord, he said, Lord, I can't do it. I seem to get along. Did I not wake you up this morning? Did I not put bread on your table? Did I not put a roof over your head? Did I not put strength in your body? And he said, well, who are thou, Lord? He said, I am. Do I have a witness? Church in America. Mm -hmm. That's a disease. Mm -hmm. 
smart enough to profit from his mistake and then strong enough to correct his mistake. You see, I make mistakes. You make mistakes. And see, one thing folk always have a sense of whenever a preacher is preaching all around America, you got to think that the preacher is really pointing at them. But all of us know in your own kitchen, you know that the faucet always get wet before the glass. Can I help a witness there? Uh, if uh, you're on the Lord's side, yes. Yes. that uh, we ought to love everybody. Do I have a witness here? You see, one thing I know mm, is the God I serve. Yes. He came here to save humanity. Yes. Do I have a witness here? Mm, and I um, mean, really, mm, really want to know who my God is. Yes. Uh-huh, his name is Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He is the God of all comfort. He is the God who stretched out the heavens like a curtain. And who made the clouds his chariot. Who moves in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform. Uh-huh, he's so big. And he's so bad. Is that he plants his footsteps yeah. out on the sea yeah. and he rides uh, the mighty storm. Yeah. I say, ain't he all right? Yeah. Yeah. He walks through a lily patch yeah. and declares the lily's right. Uh, and in the rustling of the grass, he passes. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. He scooped up the oceans yes, with the palm of his hand uh, yeah. and then held it in place uh, with an invisible wall. I said, ain't he all right? Yeah. He put in aeronautical skills uh, in a little bitty bird. Yeah. He put uh, in distress in a little bitty ant. He put a honey factory in a little bitty bee. He put gymnastics uh, in a dangling monkey. He put a bass drum in the chest of a gorilla. I said, ain't he all right? Uh, and he all right. He's the anchor 